And And uh, at the end of this talk, um, there will be the opportunity to ask Richard questions. I will open up the stage for that. Um, you can uh, submit your questions through the chat function and I will uh, either ask them on your behalf or if you would like to do so, you can always unmute yourself upon request and uh, engage with Richard. And uh, with, with that, let's get on with our show. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, to our community and to introduce to you our speaker, Richard Watson. Um, what we have here is we are all living in a time of gloom and doom and this terrible thing that we call Zoom, uh, when even simple decisions of whether or not you can go to the pub with your mates requires intense study of a government rule book and assessments of the depth of your friendships because you're limited uh, as to the number of humans you're actually allowed to interact with. So we're all faced with a particularly um, um, well, what we think might be a very grim and difficult future to even comprehend. Um, so right now, what we really need is someone who can help us think, plan better, and who better to do that than our very own in-house futurist, Richard. So Richard is the futurist in residence at the Entrepreneurship Center at the Judge School, and we've borrowed him for the evening, of course. Um, before this, he worked with the uh, Tech Foresight Practice at the Imperial College. He is the founder of a website called nowandnext.com, where he has uh, where he publishes what's next reports that are detailed commentaries on what drives change, and he speculates quite extensively on future directions. His uh, passion seems to be on uh, emerging technologies, on artificial intelligence, robotics, and definitely global business and economic trends. In fact. He has uh, served several big names in the corporate world, including Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and of course, our own university, uh, by helping them all to think and to strategize. He continues to engage as a guest lecturer for the London Business School as well. Um, Richard is the author of five books, the latest one being Digital Versus Human. However, he is best known for his, uh, for his design of these provocative roadmaps that the Financial Times has called brave, while the Business Insider says they will blow your mind. I'm, I'm very sure they will. And uh, with that, over to you, Richard, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Let me just um, do a screen share. And see if we can get this up. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd like to apologize about being on Zoom, actually, more than anything else. Hang on. Um, it's not the best way to present. I, I prefer, and it's not the easiest as well. I, I prefer having a screen behind me and maybe some notes um, in front of me and an audience I can fully see and interact with. But it is what it is, which is a theme I'm going to come back to. Um, you've just heard um, what I do. I don't work full time at the judge, but I'm, I'm, I'm tend, tend to be there on Fridays. And... What do I actually do? Well, I, I think about the future. Um, I talk to people about it. I write about it. I think about it. If you'd like to pick up on what the future actually means, how you define it, because I, I, I mean, it is next Tuesday, but that's not my working definition. I'm happy to pick that up um, in the Q&A. Now, one of the things that you've just heard that I do is, is to draw maps. Um, here is one that I did back in 2017. Uh, based on an earlier map I'd done. And the headline is essentially referring to me at the time. My, my head was in a bit of a spin for various reasons. Um, and it seemed to me that I wasn't alone. There were a lot of people that seemed to be quite anxious about the future, but also the present and arguably even the past. And I think that's become more true actually over the last couple of years. Um, there's clearly far too much information on this map, but that's on the map itself. Um, the bullet points, by the way, the big blobby things, are uh, sort of mega trends, and if, if if there is a now on the map, it's right in the middle. And as you radiate outwards, you go deeper into the future, and it becomes more speculative. Um, at the bottom, there are some global game changes. By the way, this I, this can be circulated. You can find this very easily online and so on. Um, at the bottom, there are some um, global game changes, and bottom right, there is a global pandemic. This was 2017, remember. Um, I, ordered, I also added aliens and the return of the Messiah down there just to cover all bases. Um, now, I didn't have a vast amount of work to do last year. Um, I do a lot of speaking globally and that completely dried up apart from the odd thing on Zoom. Um, so I had a little bit of uh, um, time on my hands. Um, 
my head became very scrambled as well. So I, I actually found it very, very difficult to read anything, let alone write anything. Um, one of the things I did manage to do was quite a nice Christmas card, um, which I, I haven't actually used. I don't think I've used this before in a, in a presentation, but I think it just sort of um, touched on why there was a sort of slight whiff of despair in the air at the time. So this, this is going back to December 2020. Um, I had to speak to my own children to work out what a couple of these were. Um, the one in the middle let me know I still subscribe to heavily. Um, I don't think we're out of this quite yet. I'm feeling pretty optimistic, but there's quite a few things that could still happen. Um, so we are going to have to sort of wait and see and to some extent, I think, get, get used to it. Um, but seriously, why, you know, have, has this anxiety always been here? there here um if not where's it come from how did it arrive and, and so on and so forth um back in 1989 the u.s department of defense came up with this term vuca volatile uncertain complex ambiguous and it was a phrase used to describe the geopolitical landscape after the fall of the berlin wall and and particularly U.S. relations with Russia and a number of other countries. Now, I can't really remember 1989 very well, but it does seem like a really, really good description of now to me, or of the early part of the um, 21st century. But I think there's actually far more to this idea of VUCA than U.S.-Russian relations. And I, I touched on in this, in this book that I wrote, the last book I wrote, which also came out in 2017, Digital Versus Human. Um, I'll just quote you a little passage from this. The distant future had once been hopeful and at times rather fun. It had been a preview of coming attractions. But by late 2007, this was obviously the global financial crash, people had given up hope of seeing flying cars or owning personal jetpacks. All anyone wanted to know was whether everything would turn out all right. Would there be a comforting resolution after the explosive opening sequence? That's as a reference to 9-11. Would computer-generated special effects continue to enthrall us? Or would the computer move from all-conquering hero to sinister villain lurking behind our flickering screens? That's kind of the big tech backlash that's going on slightly, although they've redeemed themselves recently with Zoom and a few other things. This dystopian comfort was likely linked to a feeling that things had got out of control. Events were unfolding too fast for most people to comprehend. Gone were the days when you could start a broken down car by yourself or understand how a camera worked. Even by 2007, it wasn't just credit default swaps or additionality linked to carbon credits that were baffling. You almost needed a degree in systems theory simply to switch on a domestic washing machine. Seriously, do we really need 40 plus washing choices, including the incomprehensible option to wash your clothes later? Complexity, synonymous in engineering terms with instability, had become a hallmark of the early 21st century and the world's axis had shifted towards the outskirts of normal. This was unsettling, especially to anyone brought up in an analog Western-centric world where globalization had initially meant Americanization and cheap washing machines. Now, this passage actually ends with a quote from the much loved and much missed writer Douglas Adams, who by the way, attended St. John's College. And this is his quote. Everything that's already in the world when you're born is just normal. Anything that gets invented between then and before you turn 30 is incredibly exciting and creative. Anything that gets invented after you're 30 is against the natural order of things and the beginning of the end of civilization we, as we know it, until it's been around for about 10 years when it gradually turns out to be all right, really. Now, that's sort of one way of looking at it. There's a counter argument, which um, has a bit of history. Um, I'm sure most of you won't know about this, but it's, it's worth checking it out. Um, this was a book written in 1970 by Alvin and Hyde B. Toffler, and it, it's probably one of the most famous um, futurist texts, if you, if you call it that. And it, it sought to describe a feeling of bewilderment and disorientation. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to wonder what on earth did we have to worry about in the early 1970s? But what we perhaps forget is this was an era of, of geopolitical de destabilization too. There was Vietnam, the Arab Israeli war, a bunch of other wars, there was an oil crisis, the birth of international terrorism, the birth of, or the birth of mainstream computerization. There was the Garden House riot at Cambridge. I had to look that one up. Strikes, inflation, and quite a lot of doom and gloom, but not quite Zoom. So I suspect we've always been anxious to some extent. We've always needed or wanted to invent new fears in a way. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Um, this is a photograph of a street in central London in 1893. And what you're looking at is horse manure, horse poo. Um, you can barely walk down the street. Um, about a year later, there was a somewhat hysterical um, leader article in Times predicting that every street in London would soon be buried under several feet of manure. Um, now, 
that did look like quite a likely scenario and people were gen I mean it sounds funny now but people were genuinely worried about this um, and there was no end in sight not until anyone somebody um, Carl Benz a couple of years later invented the horseless carriage at any rate which I think just goes to prove that unexpected ideas and, and events can derail conventional wisdom pretty quickly and you should never ever really base any kind of future forecast or prediction on linear extrapolation, particularly from current conditions or relatively recent data. But let, let's go back to this idea of, of why a lot of people are feeling unsettled, um, why a lot of much younger people than I are, are perhaps feeling that there isn't actually much of a future to, to, to become connected with. Um, that's a bit odd in some respects. This is a chart um, about human development. Um, and now human development is a composite index used by the United Nations. It measures life expectancy, um, years of schooling, per capita income and such like. And what it's showing more or less is life has got significantly better for the vast majority of people on the planet quite recently. Um, I mean, life expectancy, infant mortality, extreme poverty, deaths from war and serious crime. Uh, the number of women in education and employment, thank you Lady Lucy Cavendish, um, gender equality, sexual equality, racial equality, They're, none of these are perfect but they've got a lot better I think. Um, there's still a lot to do as well, a lot of those things still need work, we've got climate change as just one example of, of something that we need to deal with rather urgently, but on the other hand we haven't just come through World War One only to be hit with the Spanish flu that killed somewhere between 10 and 100 million people, so again why why the unease? What, where is this anxiety coming from exactly? Um, one thing that's quite interesting, I think, to my mind anyway, about this chart is, is the, obviously the sudden upward arc. What is that about? I, I think until you get to that point, development is, has got to, a lot to do with the augmentation of human muscle. It was about machines replacing human, literally human muscle. Um, when it starts to take off, I think one of the possible narratives, that certainly one that I subscribe to, it's about the augmentation of human brain power, of human cognition. Um, we've, we've, in a sense, developed a sort of hive mind or a collective consciousness that has, is being amplified by artificial intelligence. And again, I'm not saying the world's perfect. I'm not saying that everyone's having a great time or is getting better off, but an awful lot of people are. Now, why is this happening? I mean, globalization, I think, is, is one of the things that we could point to, and it gets a bad rap, but, you know, it, it has lifted a lot of people out of some pretty terrible conditions, albeit with some negatives. Um, and digital connectivity has, has had many positive aspects as, to it as well. Um, but there's negatives as well as positives, like there are with most things. Now, I mean, physical connectivity, and I, I guess I'm talking about global markets and freedom of movement almost more than anything else, does mean that a virus can travel from China around the world in a blink of an eye or a problem with um, subprime debt in US banks and become a global crisis in the banking system within a matter of, matter of days. Um, digital connectivity is a great thing on many respects. Um, we know more people than ever before but I'd argue we know them far less well and in some cases not at all and this might be feeding into our anxiety, our unease at least. Um, there's a wonderful woman at MIT called Sherry Turkle who wrote a great book um, which sums it up which was called Alone Together. Um, now I touched on this in a, a book I wrote called Future Minds in 2010. To my mind smartphones are wonderful things but taken to extremes they, they can become a sort of form of modern servitude. They have atomized our attention, they have created or at least amplified um, a culture of instant gratification, we can't wait for anything anymore. Um, we've traded intimacy for familiarity and they also, particularly if you don't switch them off, um, they lure us away from many of the things that make us calm and content and my prime example there would be nature. Um, I think the, um, oh sorry, I lost a page, beg your pardon, that was something I didn't see coming. Um, another thing that's happening is um, what the Oxford neuroscientist Susan Greenfield um, talks about in some of her books. Our identities, according to her, were once created quite privately and, and, and internally, and they were very solid. Um, these days, they have a tendency to be created externally and publicly. You know, our identities have become very, very visible publicly. And particularly this, this development of, of liking things potentially makes these identities very, very fragile. The liking can be withdrawn at a moment's notice. Um, now, I'm not sure I'm the most objective person when it comes to matters digital but I, I do like um, 
what somebody called Jack White said about digitalization and particularly connectivity. Um, Jack White is from the White Stripes, the band. And he said that for him, digital technology generally, not always, but generally is a destroyer of truth. Um, in particular, he talks about easy convenience. It affords removing us from the satisfaction that comes from things that are time consuming, hard or difficult. There's another thing that he doesn't talk about that, that I have talked about a little bit as well, which is because convenience and efficiency are so important to most of us, we tend to do what's easiest, what's fastest. So if we're searching for something, we, we don't go to the library, we go to Google, we search it and we, we probably just look at page one or two, or if you're really lucky, page three of results. So what that tends to mean is we're all looking at exactly the same stuff. And to my mind, one of the things that might be um, a casualty of, of global connectivity and, and this, this ease is an erosion of deep curiosity and originality. Now, the other thing that's, that's going on, I think, to some extent, is our focus, instead of being um, outwards, is now downwards. You know, we are looking at these phones the whole time. This is a photograph I, I took of um, people on the platform at Gatwick Airport a number of years ago. Um, I've, I've sort of tried to hide people's identity because I still believe in privacy. Um, there's an awful lot of communication going on here, that's for sure, but I, I would argue it's fairly isolated, it's pretty passive, it could be non-contextual and it's certainly non-verbal and it, it, it worries me a little bit that these people aren't talking to themselves. I mean, this is generational to some extent. I mean, you know, I get enough trains and I mean, frankly, nobody talks to anybody else unless they're over the age of about 80, possibly if they're female as well helps and they will chat to absolutely everyone. And it's a, actually a rather wonderful thing. Now, taken to extremes, um, I think we slightly know where this can go. Um, I don't know if any of you know about or even remember the Romanian orphanages, orphanages that were discovered in 1989, 90. But we know what the extreme withdrawal of human contact can do to people. It can have quite devastating context. Now, consequences. Now, I'm not for one moment equating that to that, but it is to some extent a spectrum. And we've got to be very, very careful. And one of the things that concerns me at the moment is this sort of withdrawal of the human interface. You go to the supermarket, you no longer have a, a checkout person. You have to sort of check yourself out if it's MS, for example. You go to the tube, there's nobody to buy a ticket off. You have to use a machine. We are deleting human contact in quite a significant way. Um, so what's the answer to this? Um, one of the things I'm a huge fan of is Stoicism and, and the Stoic philosophers. You know, why worry about things that are completely out of our control? I think one of the solutions to feeling uneasy, to feeling sort of anxious or overwhelmed, or feeling that you're always on the back foot, um, or distressed by external events, I suppose, you know, Trump or something, is, is to understand that such feelings are not due to the events, events themselves, but due to our estimate or interpretation of them. And we have the power to reframe or rename these things or, or to revoke our reaction or action at any moment. Now, this is actually, I think, I'm not a, I'm not a Buddhist, I don't know a vast amount of, about Buddhism, but I think this is a part of the Buddhist mindset. Um, the other way of dealing with it is, um, as the, the, the contestants on the reality TV show Love Island put it rather succinctly, it is what it is, or it is what it is in it. Um, now, this is passively, a, potentially a bit passive, and, and I think if you take that to extremes, rather nihilistic. So are there other, some other options that we could, we could think about? Um, the first thing I'd say is rather than worrying about where the world is heading, worry about where you would like it to go. Um, last year, I think it was sort of lockdown one, I was getting a lot of calls and emails from journalists saying, you know, what do you think is going to happen next? And my reaction generally was, I haven't got a clue. Um, you know, things were unfolding far too fast to, to digest. We weren't quite sure what the facts were. And I'm not talking about a sort of Trumpian post-truth fake news environment. I'm talking about the fact that in terms of dealing with COVID um, cases, we literally didn't know what the best way to, to treat them was in those, those early days. Um, the question I really should have been asked and we should have been asking ourselves and were asking each other for a while was, what do we want to happen? Where do we want to go? One of the wonderful things, and there were some dreadful things about um, lockdown one, but one of the, the good things that came out of it, well, in fact, there were a number of good things. I think we slightly rediscovered local community. We rediscovered nature. Um, and we also had the situation where people had a lot of time on their hands for the first time. And they thought quite deeply, possibly for the first time ever in, in some cases. And what they were thinking about was 
essentially, am I leading a good life? How would I like to change my life if I survive this? Which is, is pretty close to some of the oldest philosophical questions in the world, really. Um, I think one of the reasons, sorry, oops, no, hang on. That's my, well, yes, there we go, Buddhism. Sorry, I missed a slide. Um, I think one of the reasons that there's been an outbreak of unease and anxiety of, of late is that we have quite literally lost sight of where we're going. If you go back, I don't know, to the 80s, the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, I think most people had a view of what the future was going to look like. Now, looking back at that with hindsight, we were delusional. We were completely wrong, but it, it sort of didn't matter in a, in, a, in a way. At least we had some kind of idea what it was all about and, and where we're going. And I, I think we've sort of lost that now. Um, we've got declining trust, particularly generationally. We've lost faith in a lot of institutions. Um, and there is no vision articulated for where we're going as a species beyond that that might be coming out of Silicon Valley and is being articulated by a lot of white young men that are quite techy, um, which suits them, but doesn't necessarily suit everyone else on the planet. Um, I mean, it's a bit like we've sort of been cast adrift in slightly choppy seas in a leaky boat with no anchor, no compass and no side of the stars and no destination. So it's not surprising in a sense that we're feeling a little bit uneasy. Um, one of my favourite books, um, and, and certainly my favourite book about the human condition, I think, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which was published in 1946. Small book, great book. And it chron chronicles his experiences of the Nazi death camps. Sounds very depressing, but actually it's quite an uplifting book. And for me, his key message was the importance of purpose. We need something to aim at or to look forward to, or, or, in, or in the case of the concentration camps, you know, we need a reason to live. I think he also sort of made it fairly clear that, that optimism beats pessimism hands down, um, but that wasn't really the, the key message. I think the key message was about around purpose. But, you know, I think here's the thing, to my mind, for purpose to work, um, it ultimately needs to sort of touch other people, um, touch other human beings. And it, to some extent, needs to be something well, it can't be something that's easy you can accomplish in 20 minutes that's that's no purpose for me it's got to be something that is going to take a very long time or may never actually be finished at all um in short it's got to be something extremely difficult to do um i think there are exceptions to that i think you can you can do certain things that are terribly easy to do and terribly small that make an enormous difference in the world but i think it helps if if they're big um the sculptor henry moore i think picked up on this he, this is a quote from him um, the secret of life is to have a task, something you devote your entire life to, something you bring everything to every minute of the day for the rest of your life. So far, so good. So far, so obvious. But he goes on. And the most important thing is it must be something you cannot possibly do. So these are the sort of the huge things that we try, try and accomplish that I think give enormous satisfaction and purpose. Now, maybe that's not for you. Um, what else can I recommend? Um, how else might you reframe the future to lift your mood or to transcend the daily deluge? Um, my first answer is, oh, sorry, I have my slides. This is the problem with Zoom, you see. It's, I'm, I'm multitasking. It's all going horribly wrong. Um, my first answer is, is to get the heck outside. Um, and in particular, to go for a walk. Any walking will do. Um, but if you can walk in a green space, it really, really does make quite a big difference. Um, I think psychologists have long hypothesized that, that about the constant demands of sort of email and Twitter feeds and Facebook updates and, you know, things to do on your computer and just general business to some extent puts an incredible burden on, on the, the prefrontal cortex of our brains. Our phones, I mean, I never switch, I have to, I am guilty here. I never switch my phone off. I do tend to hide it under cushions, but I don't tend to phone it to switch it off you know so we recharge our devices but we rarely recharge ourselves and walking outside especially in green spaces appears to be a solution to this running works well although gyms are a different thing I mean gyms are better than no running at all but the problem with gyms is they're more busy spaces they're more screens um, the other thing I've been reading about recently by the way is um, running on even ground is very very good for your uneven ground is very very good for your brain so running on grass or across fields or up mountains is extremely good. Um, I would especially recommend the Cambridge Botanic Gardens, which I think are absolutely magnificent. 
Um, walking alongside the river or floating on the river, I think are, are, are two things that really work. Um, water seems to do something to the mind as well, I think, in my experience. Um, the sea is best, but rivers work really well, moving rivers, um, fl flat rivers, flat lakes, they work, but they're not quite as good as the stuff that's moving. Um, Einstein was incredibly famous for his daily walks when he was at Princeton. So too was Darwin. Um, Dickens is, is well known to have enjoyed strolling the streets of London very late at night when he was mulling over the plot for A Christmas Carol. And there are countless examples of, of great musicians, artists, scientists, writers that, that walked. Um, in fact, there was almost a sort of in, in Victorian times, you, you got up early, you worked till about lunchtime, uh, you did some correspondence, you had lunch and you went for a long walk and you fell asleep. And I swear a lot of these people were far more productive than people that did twice as much so-called work. Um, there's a great book, um, another one I can recommend, The Geography of Genius by Eric Weiner. And he comments that there is, and I quote, something about motion that triggers creative thoughts. And he goes on to say that walking quiets the mind without silencing it completely. With the volume turned down, we can hear ourselves again. It's also obviously very, very good for you physically as well as, as mentally. Um, my second tip, and it's, it's blindingly obvious, I've been talking about this for years, and it's, it's now become known as the digital detox, is switch some of this stuff off, particularly phones, but also laptops or tablets, or better still, just leave them behind and go and do something away from them for even 20 minutes a day, I think would make an enormous difference. And the other thing is, do something with your hands. Now, I particularly like growing plants, um, especially fruit and vegetables. Um, that's my dad with my two crids. I, I particularly like this photograph. So he's just picked some raspberries, which I don't think my eldest son had ever seen in his life coming out of a garden. And I, I rather like the quizzical look of my younger son going on there. Um, I find gardening incredibly therapeutic. I think weeding is almost my favorite activity because it's very mundane and arguably quite boring, but it's, it's what it does to my mind I find fascinating. It starts to drift in a, in a rather beautiful manner. Um, washing the dishes works quite well, um, baking, sewing, fixing something that's broken, doodling with a pencil, all of these things are great. Um, anything that's non-taxing, and um, for heaven's sake don't try to multitask when you're doing this, um, and it's great because it's using a different part of your brain, so it's giving certain parts of your brain the chance to relax, um, to recharge. Um, and you know, I can't speak for, for everybody, but when I'm doing some of these activities, it's not only just sort of mellowing and satisfying. I do often have these aha moments. I suddenly remember where I've left something, which is obviously stuck in my deep subconscious, or I, I've solved a problem, or I've, I've literally come up with lines for books, ending for one book, um, whilst doing weeding or being half asleep on the bed or something like that. Um, my third thought is to link yourself to something much bigger than yourself and this this to some extent comes back to the thought about purpose and particularly helping other people um back in 2012 there was a study by tel aviv university um which reported that smallness in the face of vastness leads to expansive and creative thinking um again that that works for me um i think really well on airplanes particularly if i've got a window seat and i can see a very long way Halfway up a mountain works very well. A deserted beach works very well. I even had a great discussion with a computer scientist at Imperial College about whether, it's funny, computer scientists and mathematicians seem to be the only people still using blackboards. Everyone else has got whiteboards or interactive boards, but they still love blackboards with chalk. And we had quite a good conversation about, I don't know where it came from, but we had a really good conversation about whether the size of your blackboard influences the nature of your thinking. I mean, do you have bigger thoughts with bigger blackboards? And I mean, this is a sample of one, but he said, absolutely, undoubtedly. Um, and that also applies to me with sheets of paper. I, I tend to, here's one actually, just randomly. This is something I'm doing at the moment for the judge. It's um, it's the sort of origins of AI. And I don't think you can do that on A4. You need, you need expanse to think expansively. Um, I mean, for others, this effect happens um, looking at the sky at night, um, you know, a clear night sky. Um, Brian Cox, everyone's favorite physicist and television presenter, said that the thought of our blue print prick of a planet amid the enormity of dark space initially makes one feel that we are totally insignificant. I'd agree with that. But then from the void comes the dawning realization that we are connected across time and space with everything that ever was or ever will be. That last bit's my words, not his, but I think the sentiment is there. We are, and again, this is quite Buddhist, we are fundamentally connected to absolutely everything. So in a sense, we are vastly important. 
Um, I think the, the eternity of space, in a sense, is affirmation, if needed, that we all count in some way. You know, it's the vastness of nothingness, in a sense, that gives technicolor intensity to our lives generally and, and the present moment in particular. And I think nature generally does that, but there's something very, very good about space. Um, now to end, um, I'd like to sort of switch back to what for me was a sort of key learning from the last 12 months and particularly March, April of last year, which is something that, that uh, I had slightly forgotten and I think a lot of people had slightly forgotten, which is that physical proximity and, and most of all human contact matters. I mean, if you talk to people, um, and again, this is anecdotal, so apologies, but I, I spoke to a number of people about, well, what did you miss during that first lockdown, which if you remember was quite a severe lockdown, it wasn't like two and three. Um, and, you know, we had pubs, but we had busy pubs, we had restaurants, but we're talking busy restaurants. Most of all, I think, came through was, was sort of cinemas, theatres and live music events and clubs. Um, although topping that actually was giving somebody you love a hug it was the absolute top of the thing that, that people had missed. Um, and, you know, I think, I think um, you know, having a goldfish or having a pot plant, and I thoroughly recommend everyone should have a pot plant to look after, that can work wonders. But ultimately, I think what we need is each other. Um, but linking back to that earlier point about phones, um, for this to really work, one needs to be fully present. You, you can't be having a conversation with somebody and constantly glass, glancing at your phone when it goes ping. You need to put it away and switch it off. And I'm, I'm no Luddite here. I'm not suggesting you get rid of them. I'm just suggesting a bit of balance and now and again, turn it off or leave it somewhere. Now, in the conclusion of my book, Digital Versus Human, um, I wrote about um, stumbling into the world's smallest music venue. Strange way to end a book about artificial intelligence, robots and screens, but there you go. Um, this was a, a music venue created by two musicians. Um, one was called Emily Barker and one was called Dom Quixote. And the way it worked was this, they had a small wooden box. And when I say small, I mean really quite small. Um, there was enough room for one musician and 30 centimeters away, there was one audience member um, who listens to one song in complete darkness. And the idea is, is sort of both completely mad and illogical, but rather visceral at the same time. Um, one person apparently um, described the box as completely disorientating. Um, it certainly blurred the line between what's weird and what's wonderful. Um, and I think the shadowy darkness, you know, it made some people laugh out loud because they thought it was so completely crazy. Um, and other people apparently were actually reduced to tears, which is quite an interesting reaction to sitting in a dark box listening to one song. Um, I think what it proves to me is that in an age of sort of demeaning and diminishing automation, you can see my biases here, and subhuman cities, um, cities, by the way, I mean, I know this half of us now live in, in large cities and it's going to be 70% by mid-century. I just have a sort of instinct that we weren't really evolved to live in cities. I think, I think removing nature too much has some pretty significant consequences, but, but you know, maybe we'll leave that for the, the Q&A. Um, so, yeah, in an age of demeaning and diminishing automation and subhuman cities, it proves that human intimacy still matters and that the, 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 what we're all searching for has to do with human contact. In the case of um, the music venue, it was what was right in front of people's faces, although they couldn't see it in the darkness. Now, I've got two more slides. Um, the first one is, is a good old Stoic philosopher, uh, Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher and emperor. Um, I think this sort of proves to me, to, ex to some extent, that we've always worried about the future. Um, worrying about the future has got a very, very, very long history. Um, and we get hysterical about things that the Romans and the Greeks were getting hysterical about. You know, kids with no attention span, that's a 2000 year old problem. Um, kids that don't listen to their parents, 2000 year old problem. Uh, my final words are from Douglas Adams again, and specifically um, his creation, Marvin the Paranoid Android from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So Cambridge person, as you recall. Now, I don't know how many people of you will be familiar with the book or, or the radio series or the TV series or the film, but Marvin was afflicted with boredom and depression because in, in Adam's words, he had the brain the size of a planet, which he was very rarely asked to use. Um, his advice, I and mean, this is, a, if, you, if you're going to sum up the entire book, I think don't panic is the summation. I think that's great advice. I think that's great advice for all of us and indeed the human species going forward. Uh, I think that's 32 minutes, which isn't bad. Thank you very much. Plenty of time for Q&A. Thank you. 
it's really disorientating by the way when you finish something it's total silence just to let you know yes i i agree with you richard <laughs> thank you so very much that was uh that was a really wonderful talk and uh honestly a a message of hope <laughs> today was one of those days when i woke up and felt like doom and gloom so i feel a lot better now thank you very much and i will stop panicking um, we already have one question popping up on our um, chat, so I'll just kick off with that. Um, so I believe it's P. Tukral. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question, or do you want me to read it out? I can see it if that helps, but happy to have it read. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, so she wants to know if you think that digital technology is what's making us lazy, and is that one of the causes of the destruction of creativity? I think we should be very careful about assigning blame for anything to one thing. There, there will almost always be multiple causes, but I think it, it is one of the things that, that might be responsible. I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty old. Um, I started work in the early 80s um, and we used to go out to lunch rather a lot back then. Um, sometimes these lunches were four hours long. Um, we'd get back to the office having had a couple of glasses of wine our productivity, I think, might be double what it would be now because we weren't constantly asked, being sort of copied into emails, attending virtual meetings. I don't know. I don't know what we were doing, but I think we were more productive back then. And I think it, it does. It, su it sucks our attention, but it also we, we tend to sort of deal with what's urgent rather than what's important a lot of the time because of this. Mm. Um, and I, I do think that's the problem. There, there are. You know, these trends are like are like almost sort of Newtonian forces or something. They, you know, you, if you get a really big trend, you quite often get a counter trend and globalization, digitalization are very big trends. I'm beginning to see organizations try to encourage people to have maybe a half a day or a day a week where they don't use tech. They go and talk to people in person or they, or at least they phone them up. I know that's still tech, but <laughs> they get off email essentially. So the sort of dress down Friday has turned into sort of no tech Tuesday or something. And I think that that's a really, really good thing to do. Um, I th I'm worried about, and I write about this in Digital Versus Human, I'm, I'm, I think convenience is, is problematic on some levels, but it's such a strong force. I mean, that's one of the reasons we don't necessarily change our behaviors around the environment. I mean, it takes, it takes a five pence charge on a plastic bag to change, it's not, you know, because otherwise it's all around convenience. Um, efficiency is another one, by the way. I, I think we, we because we do something fast, we think we're being incredibly great. And actually some of the things that, that take a very long time are far better. Or, I mean, the other thing, I'm not sure this really connects with this, but um, I think this is a hangover from the industrial revolution is that if you're in an organ, I'm talking about commercial organizations here, not academia, which is a bit different. Um, if you're working for a big company and you are seen to have your feet on the desk all day staring out of the window, you will probably eventually get fired because the idea is you're not working. We've still got this mindset that you need to be running around physically moving, doing stuff to be useful and productive and worth having. Uh, but if you are paid for your brain and your ideas and your thinking, <laughs> that's not true necessarily. I mean, it's true if you work on a production line. And who is to say that walking through the park in, in Cambridge or staring out of the window uh, 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 um, isn't the best thing you'll do all year. So I think we've got to be careful about that. But I think it is a problem. Thank you very much. Oh, I like the Cassandra one. Oh, absolutely. Please go ahead. Um, That's I'll a great just... question. I've thought about that quite a lot. Never written about <laughs> it, but I've thought about it. Um, Cassandra from memory was right. Yeah, but nobody listened. Um, I mean, I, OK, here's, here's some interesting context. Back in 2015, I attended two cabinet office workshops on extreme risks. In one of them, a global pandemic was widely agreed as the most likely or highest probability high impact event. That got turned into some work, I think it was called Project Signa or something where, where people modeled a pandemic. They slightly modeled the wrong one, but you know, mind. Um, but still everyone sort of claims to be surprised and we weren't, we weren't ready for it. What is going on there? So that, this sort of trips into who gets listened to if anyone and why? My feeling is timing is critical. So if, and also, you know, who says it? If, it, if it's a sort of old white bloke that went to Cambridge, they will tend to get listened to far more than 
a sort of sprightly 22 year old woman from you know the university of wherever um who's dressed badly possibly you know the suit still makes an important difference um and but timing as well so i mean the whole thing around digital nobody was listening to 10 11 years ago i remember um george soros at davos said something and all of a sudden everyone's all over it so i think your the timing matters you can be too soon but you've also got to have some kind of credentials and i'm not entirely sure what they are but you can't be just anybody um if you're a sort of aging hippie with very long hair and 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 your, your knees coming through your jeans you're probably not going to get listened to which is wrong but it's just how it is um i mean the other classic there i'm sorry i'm going on a bit here but we do have a bit of time was kodak springs to mind um everyone forgets that kodak invented digital photography but still managed to go bankrupt which is quite an achievement um, and the reason that they went bankrupt is that nobody listened to R&D when they said this could be a problem. Um, they also, by the way, they had a culture which was all about printing photographs and they completely missed the fact that people might not print them anymore. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think it depends on who you are. Um, if you're well known and you have credentials, you tend to get listened to. But not always. If you're, if you're too outside, if you're too in the fringe, you still won't get listened to. <laughs> way of the world huh um our, we have another question from uh from bruno cotta and would you oh, bruno. question bruno this is just a heckle oh <laughs> well, he, he wants to know um right what role will our emotional intelligence have in helping us stay rational and get the best out of ai in the future oh i've got it okay let me just read this Oh, where do you start with that one? I mean, I'm hoping that the future is 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 digital and human. We, you know, we let machines, particularly AI, and we should say sort of broad AI here, because AI we've had for years, um, we let the AI or whatever else do its thing and we do our thing. Um, I mean, there are people around, quite depressing people, that say essentially there's nothing we do that an AI can't do. I, I don't agree with that for a second. Um, and it's certainly not going to be a problem in my lifetime. Um, you know, we're good at the emotional stuff. It's, we're good at the EQ stuff. We're good at empathy. We're good at listening. We're good at motivating, inspiring, and leading people. I, I don't think AIs or robots make great leaders. So anything management is pretty good. Creativity, by the way, I'm on the fence on that a bit. I think AIs can be very creative, but I think we might have a deeper level of it than can be achieved with with an AI. The, the problem I have around IQ versus EQ um, in an educational context is that education, and I'm primarily talking about primary, secondary, but, but tertiary, univers universities too, we are to some extent, certainly pre-university, teaching people to do what machines and computers and AI are really good at already. Learn a fact, which is fixed theoretically, um, and spit it out in an exam. It's, it's a recall memory test. Machines are unbelievably good at that. We're not teaching people about, you know, looking, listening, curiosity, empathy, um, how to deal with people. I mean, that's a great lesson. Um, there are some exceptions. I mean, Harvard has a wonderful module on, on um, deep, deep looking, where they get people to look at a painting for three hours and see what happens to their brains. And it's about observing and it's about curiosity and it's about, it's also about what it does to your brain. Um, I'm not entirely sure that answers Bruno's question, but it's, it's sort of in the direction of, I think. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have- well, can, I, actually, can I just add a supplementary to that? The other thing I think, if, if you talk to employers, and I'm talking commercial, not academics here, um, the big buzzword at the moment is they want people that are curious. I'm not sure they really do, because really curious is incredibly disruptive. But they definitely want people that are um, emotionally aware and are personable and have character. So maybe even slightly a bit eccentric in, in, in some cases. So it's, it's, around, yeah, it's around sort of being an interesting person and being interested in other people. I think getting that taught is a really important point. I mean, some people have it naturally, others don't. Right. Um, we have a question from Emma Morton. Uh, Emma, would you like to unmute yourself? Okay. Um, I'll just go on. I've got it. Uh, oh, okay. You just let me read it. Have look. Uh, 
Oh, wow. Where do you start with that? Um, I mean, firstly, just, just as context with the pandemic, I don't really think anything new's happened. What's happened is it has accelerated and deepened trends that were happening already. So the digitalization of health, the digitalization of, you know, Zoom meetings, education, employment, and, and, and all the rest of it. I, str I struggle to think of anything that's, that's new. I mean, the environment was already there as an issue. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, maybe, I mean, I, I, maybe, but that was happening already to some extent. Um, I, I personally, you'll be very careful here with confirmation bias because the answer I'm gonna give you is what I want to happen, not what I think will happen necessarily. Um, the way I see it, and I'm very interested in sort of weak signals, if you like, things that are happening to a few people in the fringes of things, as opposed to the mainstream. People are questioning big tech, how we use it, the ethics of some of these technologies, social media. I mean, Black Mirror, by the way, being an absolutely fabulous example of this. And if, you re if you've never seen it, you have to watch, sorry, you shouldn't say that, should you have to watch, you really should watch the first UK episode of Black Mirror because they, they deal with digital very well and they take something that's happening now and they turn the volume up to 11. Um, I think we're getting quite wise to digital. And I've seen this with my own kids when, to begin with, it was just the Wild West and anything goes. And they got quite quite subtle and clever about how they used it. And it was quite nuanced. Um, so, uh, I mean, there is a Black Mirror episode, I think, about social rating and likes and so on. I, I certainly hope not. And I don't think so. Um, I think we're smarter than that, quite frankly. Um, I, I think just just as a again as a as a supplementary, I I think the way the internet and social media works now, I very much doubt that's what it's going to look like in five or ten years time. I I think it's going to change quite significantly. Okay. Um, she has another question just to follow up. I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of plastic, the new. Uh, are you able to read it? Yep. Should I read it out for everybody? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, speaking of plastic, oh yeah, the bags. The newly evolved bacteria that is designed to digest nylon plastic comes along with a pack of other side effects, that seems to be the way, that have not been studied well. So doing things fast when it comes to development is not always the case. We may have the technology, but we are doomed to wait for quite a while before we're able and more importantly safe to use it. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, one thing that did come out of the pandemic was, my good, we're good at life sciences in this country, aren't we? And we did this stuff real fast. And there's nothing like a crisis to, to do some innovation. Um, I mean, I think the future, it's, it's not a sort of even development. And going back to that chart, which gives the impression that this lovely progress with humanity, that quite often you have a development followed by a frantic retreat. We suddenly work out I mean, I, I, the thing that's in my mind, and I have no idea where this has come from, was a drink called Sunny Delight, which was incredibly popular, but we found out it started turning some kids orange, literally, literally, they're orange, so they had to ban it. The, the, you know, side effects. I mean, everything has, everything tends to have a reaction, and quite often it's in the opposite direction. Um, and I think it's, again, it's getting that balance, and I, I would personally err on the side of caution with things, particularly if it's something you put in your mouth or in some way fundamentally... Um, affects humans. I mean, the plastic thing, by the way, is, is interesting to me in, in relation to the Cassandra thing. You know, it, it took Attenborough and, uh, and Blue Planet, to, I'm not might being overly simplistic here, but we'd known about this for a very long time and all of a sudden it became a thing. And I think it was literally Attenborough at that particular moment. I mean, he, he could have said it five years earlier and nobody would have paid attention. So there is definitely something around, around timing there. Um, and we tend to be very narrow in our thinking. I mean, everyone's getting hysterical about airplane travel. I was fully expecting a, a comment when I mentioned that I quite like sitting on planes. Um, but, you know, and, you know, it's bad for emissions and it's bad because you tend to stick the, the emissions very high up where they do the most damage. But air conditioning's dreadful, cement's dreadful, global fashion and textiles is worse than, than flight, than air airplanes. Um, we, we don't tend to look at things contextually we tend to sort of pick a little thing i'm going off topic here a little bit but um yeah th th there's a lot to be said for um for waiting and again back to this sort of culture of immediate 
gratification and speed and everything. Um, if, if somebody sort of has a problem, the, the best thing I think is to just stop for a while and to think and not do anything in a lot of instances. Um, partly because if you do that for long enough, the world's changed and something's no longer a problem. But I, I, I do think it's quite dangerous to, to sort of do a knee jerk to some of this stuff sometimes. Great. The power of not doing, I suppose, is another, another way of framing that. <laughs> Um, Amar has another very interesting question. Um, has humanity ever learned from history? And if we face another situation like COVID, would we, do you think we'd fare better? This is supposed to be upbeat, but my answer would be no. We're, we're very, very bad at learning lessons. Um, our memories are short and arguably getting shorter. Uh, I mean, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it does sort of slightly chime now and again. Um, Oh, I mean, there will. I promise you, there'll be another COVID. I mean, that take my word. I couldn't tell you whether it's next week or next year or in the year twenty seventy, though. I mean, the fact that we're building mega cities with people closer together, we've got animals closer to the people, we've got global global connecta connectivity and physical freedom of physical movement. It'll happen again. Um, I mean, we've been lucky to some extent. This is quite a mild one. I mean, what's the mortality rate? One to two percent. I mean, some of these things like MERS from from memory, you know, they can be close to fifty percent. You know, look at the Black Death, look at the Spanish flu pandemic. I mean, different contexts, but this was quite mild. I think we'll be, we'll be, we're definitely going to be much more prepared for a new one. But it's a bit like generals who are always fighting the last war. We'll probably be prepared for another COVID-21. And if we get something that's slightly different, it might come out of nowhere. Um, I mean, I'm hoping we're going to be more prepared. But my cynical nature says um, we tend not to learn. We'll be really prepared for the next five years. And if nothing happens, we'll forget all about it. Sorry, that's a depressing thought. I take, I take that back. Yeah, but I think a lot of us do tend to agree with you. Um, anyway, moving on. Adrian wants to know, how do people, particularly kids growing up today, form their values? From their parents and their peer group. Um, unfortunately, this is not something that's particularly taught in most schools, which is a shame, because it should be. I mean, you know... I've, I've, education is something I've written about a lot. My mother was a teacher. It's, it's something I get quite cross about. Um, you know, it's perfectly possible to go through most education systems with straight A's, get into a top flight university and get an extraordinary job whilst being a narcissistic, pathological nut. You know, um, you can even end up as president of the United States. Um, I think teaching people about ethics and values is extremely important. But yeah, it's not happening as much as it should do. Although, having said that, I'm beginning to see modules on ethics around technology. Um, ethics in AI is becoming quite a big thing. Although a lot of it is, is just sort of um, not greenwashing. What's the right word? It's window dressing. I'm not sure if some of these companies really mean it. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, the next question is from Leslie Thompson. She's just left, so I'll just ask it on her behalf. Should should regulation come to social media? Could we allow freedom of expression but not amplification of views by algorithms? Um, I think it's going to be inevitable. Um, I think a lot of these organised. First of all, they're probably some of them are probably going to get split up in antitrust. So, you know, what happened to Microsoft will happen to Facebook, I suspect. Um, I think some of them could very easily be reclassified as publishers so they are responsible for what people say on these platforms i personally and you know hats off to facebook on this one i personally think getting rid of anonymity would be a very good thing um i mean what you'll say to somebody anonymously is very different to what you'll say if if you're sort of putting your name forward it's a bit like you know if i'm driving in london which i never do any anymore but it's it's not fun and if somebody cuts me up i can i can be quite rude out the window i, I live in a little village i would never do that in a village because they're probably going to know who I am and I might bump into them in the shop. So my behaviour is noticeably different. I'm not awful in London, but I'm worse than I am here. Um, I think people are also getting better at regulating themselves lightly. But yeah, I think anonymity was was a real problem um, and still is. Um, I also think that the behaviour of some of the tech companies is beyond the pale, quite frankly. I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to name names or I, I just named one. Um, they're, they're quite appalling. Uh, next one's from James Laley. 
and he wants to know, is it important to keep your chosen purpose in mind and more specifically the desire to have an impact on others when you're doing solitary activities? Or does the attempt to gain a broad, broader view of things require you to distance from yourself from others? I think they might they might be two separate things. I think the solitary um, activities, the silence, the great book about silence over on my bookshelf somewhere, by the way. Um, I think that that helps your thinking. Maybe that helps you to find your purpose. And then with the purpose established, then you want to sort of do it with other people or do it for other people. Excellent. I mean, who's giggling in the background? Oh, gosh. I don't mind. I think it's great. <laughs> uh, not me. <laughs> not you. Um, well, Daniela wants to know, how do you pick on weak signals and how do you know which ones to trust? Uh, the pick is easy. The trust is difficult. Um, look for anomalies. Look for stuff that doesn't make sense. Look for weirdos. Younger people. I'm not equating those two things necessarily. Um, you're not going to find it in the mainstream with your average person. Um, younger people in particular tend to drive change. So you want to sort of hang out with, in my, I mean, you want to hang out with sort of, you know, 12 through 20 year olds or something, or maybe in mid to late twenties or something. Um, look on the fringes of markets, look, look at, um, look at people that are really passionate about something. If, if in a commercial um, context, look at somebody that's a heavy user of something that's using a lot of a product. Look at, look at customization, look at what people are doing to bicycles or cars or computers. Um, the, the, the best way though is look for an anomaly. Look at, look at data that doesn't make any sense, that's at odds with the current trend, or is possibly even going in the opposite direction. Um, in terms of whether you can trust them, you can't. Um, you know, it's a bit like, how do you know when something's not a fad, it's a trend? It's extraordinarily difficult. Um, I mean, if it starts growing, and it keeps growing and it starts penetrating the mainstream, I would tend to trust it. Um, I have a rule of three. If I hear about something like, if somebody says brain computer interfaces and I go, never heard of it, what's that? Um, if somebody else says it, I go, hmm, there it is again. If I hear it three times, I start investigating it. And the same is true with weird behavior or whatever. I, I sort of think, hmm, what's that all about? I mean, bear, bear in mind, there's an interesting sort of question within that question, which is, I mean, if you're talking about the future, by, by, by nature, it doesn't exist. It has no data. And if you take this back to entrepreneurs who are trying to sort of create things in a lot of instances for a world that doesn't yet exist, you, it's based on faith and gut and instinct more than anything else. You cannot prove that something will work. And I, I used to have this fight with Unilever versus Virgin. They're, they're, the way they test things was they just sort of, this is quite Silicon Valley, I think. They, they, they just sort of cobble something together and put it out there with some people and see what they thought of it and then change it if it wasn't working quite right. And if it really didn't work, they'd kill it. Unilever had this mindset at the time, maybe they still do, of trying to find the perfect solution to every problem, which took them years. And there is no perfect solution most of the time. Um, so that, you know, that and that's that sort of entrepreneurial agility versus this sort of lumbering corporate. I mean, the, the true beauty comes from putting those two mindsets together. I mean, if you believe something with your heart, you should do it. Don't don't rely. Don't look for the data. I mean, that's not not necessarily the case if you're developing pharmaceuticals, by the way. But but in most cases, your heart should rule your head. Excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Richard. And with that, we're out of time for today. Um, thank you all for joining us, and uh, let's thank our speaker again. This was it was a really brilliant session and a very engaging um, uh, discussion session as well. Hey, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, if anyone has another question or, or thinks of something in the shower or doing the weeding in the garden, I'm very easy to find. Ping me a question on email or something. Um, you'll have you'll definitely have Richard's uh, website and details on um, on our website um, on the Lucy Cavendish website. Um, thank you again, and I hope you will uh, join us all at the next uh, Live from Lucy session. Thank you. Have a lovely Thank you so much for having me. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.